Uh, I'm very delighted to be here uh, to basically uh, make a short presentation uh, related to China. Um, I'm an economist, actually started my career 18 years ago after graduation at uh, London School of Economics. At that time, I, know that, uh, I knew that uh, there was no um, new academic building, so ALC is also in transition for better. I, I, so this is, you know, so I, I'm very happy for that. Uh, the session, I think, is on uh, innovation, um, but uh, I think that uh, innovation certainly is very, very important for China, uh, for China, the future growth. But I, I guess that uh, from a market perspective, in particular from a macroeconomic perspective, I want to make a few points, then we will focus on this uh, innovation. Uh, I think that uh, the, uh, today's, uh, today's whole, uh, whole day will focus on um, China in transition. This is China in transition. This is China's growth over the last 30 years after applying a filtering technology named after two economists, David Hendrick and uh, Edward Prisco. If you look at those curve very carefully, they're very smooth. Of course, China's growth doesn't look so smooth over the time. It also has three unique cycles. By design, i.e., smooth transition of power from one group of leaders to the next group of leaders. Or by accident. The first cycle actually started in 1978, ended in 1989. That was an accident. We know what happened in 1989. The second cycle started from 1989, roughly ended around 2002. The transfer of power from Jiang Zemin, Zhu Rongji to the current leaders, uh, Hu Qintao and uh, Wen Jiabao. This year, of course, uh, we will see a transition of power, again, Chinese leadership, to next new leaders. Okay, next new group, new group of new leaders. If you look at those figures more carefully, I think that it has other interesting features. First of all, at the beginning of a turn of a new government, Ms. Perry talked about that already in, you know, in the, the last session. In the first four, five, even seven years, China's growth will be very strong, driven by reform. Without much reform, probably China's growth rate would, would come down sharply. How sharply? You will hear one of the uh, you know, present presenters, not in, the, uh, not in our session, 12 years ago he predicted the collapse of China's economy. Last year, there was so much talk in the city of London, in New York, and in other financial centers predicting that China's economy will collapse again. Three months ago, even in China, there was interesting debate about where the equilibrium growth rate will be for the next five years to 10 years. Perhaps at that time, the majority view was that China's growth rate would have to sh slow down sharply. By that, I mean probably will slow down towards 6% per annum. I think by now, we realized the market, I mean, the market also get more confidence about China's growth rate, growth rate for the next five years at least probably will be stabilized at around 8% or higher. China has an 8 trillion US dollar economy, okay? 8% of 8 trillion, you know that every year, you know, there's addition of GDP uh, added to the world. Professor Danny Kwa talked about that. 640 billion US dollars. US, okay, this is a, not by PPP. This is by nominal exchange rate. US has a 16 trillion US dollar economy, growing at 2%. The increase of the GDP size per year of the United States is roughly about half of China's increase. 
This is also, you know, perhaps for a good year. Europe grows at zero. China's incremental increase is infinitely bigger than Europe as time, okay? That's where China will be going. In a way that uh, um, down the road, of course, that uh, innovation will be very, very important for China. I think that uh, innovation will be surrounded in several areas. One, of course, innovation is needed to um, support the continued growth in the China's economy. I think development is the most important thing for China, not just for the next five years, but also for the next 10 years and next 30 years. China is only at the middle of its urbanization process. 51.4% of the population live in the urban area, according to a, loose, to loose, a very loose definition. If you only include those who have a proper hukou, urban residence permit, then the number probably, the ratio is only about 36, 37%. China still has a huge amount of, uh, um, I, I think a huge reservoir of labor running more or less at some kind of idle, 600 million people. Even China is able to migrate about 20 million per year from the countryside to the urban area. It will take an additional, another 30 years to complete the process. Over the next 30 years time, China should be able, I hope China will be, maintain a, a fairly high growth rate. Not back to the 10%. China doesn't need the 10%. 8%, 7%, then gradually come down. All that cause, of course, that there will be a huge amount of wealth to be created. Meanwhile, I think the economy will need a lot of innovations. One minute, okay. <laughs> China, of course, is at a very interesting stage of development. China produces the largest amount of steel among all countries. China also has the largest amount of mobile phone users among all countries. You know that if you look at some of the largest steel makers in China, many of them did very well. One of them is truly exceptionally well is Bao Steel, Bao Gang. How important is Bao Steel relative, let's say, to some telecom companies. One of them is Tencent, Tencent, Ma Hua Ten. I'm pretty much sure that you all understand. Mr. Ma is far more important than the CEO of Bao Steel. That shows how important is innovation. Mr. Ma is one million times richer than the CEO of Bao Steel. That shows the importance of, of innovation. So in a way that uh, if you do innovation right, there are so many areas that uh, you can create wealth for the society and also probably create wealth for yourself. If you can do that, that's great. Maybe one day you donate another, you know, that wealth back to LC. That's be even better. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me, excuse me being a, a tough chairman. It's those guys over there that are telling me to do it. Yeah. <laughs> No, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Jeff. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, uh, I, sorry, it's not the one I'm going sorry. to use, but it doesn't matter. So uh, I promise that you, uh, Stephen, I'll make my presentation much, much shorter, make up the time we spend with Mr. Huang. But uh, the most important thing you have learned from Mr. Huang is the importance of the innovation. But how, how to become more innovative, how to become a, an innovator, so I just want to touch upon that. Before everything, just want to uh, uh, a little bit commercial about who London Partner is. I'm, uh, uh, my name is Jeff, Jeff Chow. I'm uh, head of uh, Asia Pacific of the London and Partners. London and Partners is the mayor of London's economic development agency, and uh, we promote London internationally. Uh, we actually have many, many ambassadors, including Professor Tu, Tu Wei Ming, who uh, in last session uh, invited uh, all students come to study in London, in England. So that's part of our job as well. So we attract the best investors from the whole world to come to set up in London, to expand their business in London, uh, attract tourists as well. 
as well as the best talented students from across the whole globe to come to, to study in the London-based uni universities. Back to the word most talked about this morning, that's innovation. So who are the top innovators in the world? So one of the indicators most of the people are going to use, as I promised, I will keep my presentation and uh, four minutes so you get uh, more chance to listen to next uh, two excellent uh, presenta uh, pre presenters, including Johnson. I believe Johnson's presentation is going to be much, much interesting. So most of the indicators be used is the gross expenditure on the R&D as a percentage of the G yeah, GDP. So uh, the, uh, you get uh, the top innovators, so the green uh, colored, that's United States. So they spend 31% uh, of the world GDP, uh, sorry, world R&D spends in the whole world in the single one country. And China has actually be, uh, became the number two, so the top two innovator in the world in terms of the gross expenditure on the GDP as a percentage, uh, sorry, gross expenditure on the R&D as a percentage of the GDP. And the next is Japan and uh, followed by Germany, France, and uh, the UK. So you could see uh, countries only, and uh, most of the OECD countries, including some uh, key emerging markets here, but you couldn't see city. So on the top right corner, you see Finland. So Finland, uh, they spend 4% of the GDP on the R&D. Uh, and uh, you could see, so every thousand employ employer, they got employees, they got uh, more than 16 researchers. But where London stands, London is actually spent, uh, well, London's uh, R&D spends in the whole world is actually 5%, 5% in one single city. Why is that? Why G, uh, the R&D is so important for a city? So for a city economy, how to make it more innovative, to, uh, to make it more appealing to the investors across the whole world? And what the government policy towards that? You would see many, many announcements in recent years, especially after the 2008. So the government policy towards the innovation, towards the R&D is uh, uh, across board very uh, welcoming and uh, uh, quite uh, favorable. So in the 34 OECD countries, 26 of them, this is actually double the size of those, uh, the number of the countries 10 years ago who had, say, some uh, uh, favorable policies to attract R&D, to create an environment to attract the R&D activities in their countries. So it's mainly through the uh, corporate tax so and uh, the R&D, the tax credit. So in two months' time from the 1st of April, you would uh, 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 starting to benefit from these, uh, uh, its so-called patent box. But actually, uh, the, the top corporate income tax, UK, compared with all the other U OECD countries, is very much... Uh, attractive. So uh, you could see starting from 2008, it's Cape of Falling, uh, and uh, right now it's actually the uh, UK offers the lowest corporate tax rate compared to all the other uh, G8 countries. So it's nearly the lowest one or most attractive one in the whole OECD. Uh, only after actually Russia and uh, Saudi uh, Arabia. Uh, the corporate income rate in UK is actually lower than that in China. So for the innovations, uh, we heard in the first session, uh, Martin talk about the one-way traffic from Western to China. Actually, if we want to become more innovative, we very much need another way traffic, which is from China to the West, and actually both ways, because international collaboration, that's drive the innovation. So the innovation 
you, you, you could expect it's coming from the homegrown and uh, the international spillover. So international spillover would be through the trade, the export, so uh, the direct investment as well as the uh, talent mobility, including our uh, students sitting here. Uh, so who are the major and the performer actually uh, across the whole OECD countries, the average of this uh, and the activities are performed by the business sector. Uh, if we compare the UK and uh, China, we can see in China business is more an uh, important force to conduct all these R&D activities. So uh, in China, 73% of the R&D activities performed by the business sector compared to uh, that in the UK is just a 63%, which in other words, the business, they have actually a key task to make the whole country more innovative. Just one minute. Just one minute. So uh, within one minute, we need to know why and how those uh, business to become more uh, innovative, they will have to become more globalized, more internationalized. So, and uh, London would be a key platform for them to internationalizing themselves in terms of uh, the market size, the business environment, the talents we're having here, the financial uh, center status in the whole world, as well as the growth uh, stories. One thing I would draw your attention to what is happening in East London, that's a tech city. So to the east of the Pacific Ocean, we are having a Silicon Valley. And now to the east of the uh, Atlantic, we are creating a tech city. So I would draw your attention to what's going on in that part of the uh, city. It's actually stretching from the city, uh, the financial center, to the whole Olympic Park. And uh, if you look at this, you would understand why it's most a competitive place in the whole planet because it's just in between the Olympic Park and the old financial center. So offering the best access to the, all the financial markets facilities and to the, the best infrastructure uh, which brought about by the Olympic Games. And uh, uh, just five minutes uh, drive uh, distance, you will be getting to the city airport offering your the direct uh, uh, air links to all the European capital cities so that you can collaborate with them on the innovation. So uh, the business, the key message is the business is the, the, the major force in China to help the country to become more innovative and uh, globalizing themselves is the best way, and uh, London would be the best platform for the Chinese business to internationalize. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry to press everybody, but we're on a tight time schedule and get the floor running. Johnson. Sure. Uh, thanks, Chairman, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I will keep to my eight minutes. Um, so I'll go straight uh, into the presentation, if you don't mind. Um, Innovation, again, depending on how, how tightly or, or broadly we define innovation. Uh, basically, you know, innovation can happen in generally four categories, uh, either, either in terms of product, process, service, or business model. And if we talk about innovation in China, uh, again, if we adopt a very narrow, very tight uh, definition, uh, chances are none of the uh, Chinese companies uh, kind of fall into that category. But if you kind of broaden uh, the definition of innovation, I have a couple of uh, interesting examples. I think the key thing is not arguing whether or not China is innovative, but understanding where we are in terms of innovation and how that has or has not brought any uh, commercial success. I think that's, that's what innovation is all about. It's supposed to bring something good, uh, whether or not uh, it's for mankind or is it, uh, is it for business. Um, the, the risk of having, having many presenters and, and trying to put up data is that we might have risk of uh, data coherence. Uh, so try not to compare mine with, uh, with uh, Jeff. But anyway, 
what is interesting when I, when I saw this slide is, and probably surprising to some of you, you see that uh, uh, China actually is not that far behind, right? although probably higher than what most of us would have expected in terms of uh, the number of uh, innovation measured by uh, in terms of the number of patents. So it's increasing, obviously, from a very low base. Uh, some of the, the names, uh, we talk about Tencent just now, um, is rising very fast. And some of them uh, will, will be quite interesting. Because, I'm, I'm, again, I, I want to keep to my eight minutes, so that's why I'm rushing a little bit. Uh, <laughs> Tencent, we, we just now talk about... Uh, you know, again, it's, it's a young company, but it's growing very fast. Um, again, China is not at a stage, and we are not at a stage whereby we, we, we need to be like an apple where we create something out of nothing. China is at a stage whereby we just need to example what is out there to create something even better. So maybe with a show of hand, how many of you uh, is on WeChat? S stay there. See, I rest my case. It's something created by a company in Shenzhen, and we have so many users here in UK, in Singapore, in Hong Kong, around the world, right? So, and, and you, you see the number, right? versus Facebook, we, uh, Tencent uh, may not have as many uh, users, but the revenue is far uh, higher than that of Facebook. So if we were all excited about Facebook IPO, Right, although Tencent is already listed, but imagine if Tencent were to do an IPO today, what kind of uh, uh, interest it will draw, right? So the other one is, is Taobao on eBay, where, uh, again, you know, they adopted an idea from an existing player or provider, but they, they adopted it and adapted it to a China market. And the beauty of China now is that we started off by, by having the desire to serve China market, but for most of you who travel extensively, uh, even all the way down to Africa, you'll find that Chinese are everywhere, right? <laughs> in South Africa, we have a Chinatown, right? So what, set, what, what started out as a product that's, what, that, that was just aiming to serve China actually uh, can easily become global because Chinese are everywhere. So basically, again, we talk about the four, four dimension product, service, process, and business model in a way. You can find Chinese examples there, but I have uh, two more minutes. I just want to bring something to you. Again, the innovativeness of Chinese entrepreneurs in being creative. Again, maybe not creating some, uh, something out of nothing, but creating something that is truly effective in a market like China. And the beauty of China is that in a market of 1.4 billion population, you, know, you just need to be a little bit successful. Uh, the absolute return can be very good, right? So, hot pot, how innovative can hot pot get, right? So, it's, it's the soup, it's the secret sauce and all that. They did not innovate that. They, in, they innovated in terms of process and business model. So, they, they empower um, the, the employee. So, instead of the, the owner trying to be smart, he make everyone, you know, it, Chinese, as we know, sangge chou bi jiang, you know, is, is better than the chou ge liang. So, if you have hundreds of so Bijang, you have a few Zhuge Liang in, in, in your organization. So, you know, they, 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 they try to capture the heart of the employee uh, so, such that they are motivated. So when your employees are motivated, you have a happy customer. And, and you know what follows next, right, when you have a happy customer. So, you know, simple things and yet was not delivered before. So if, if you go to a hot pot restaurant, we know, you know, the sizzling soup gets into your glasses, uh, your mobile phone and all that. So what do you do? Give them a, a plastic bag, all right? So uh, uh, while waiting, you know, you have your shoe shine, you have your manicure, everything done for free. I, when I first went there, I thought it was bizarre, but guess what? We all enjoy that, right? So those of you who have been to Haiti Lao, when you first went there, why would a hot pot restaurant provide manicure? But you actually enjoy that, right? Because while waiting, you don't mind having your nails polished. I mean, not for the men, but, <laughs> right? Maybe for some men. Okay, one more minute. Uh, actually, I have two more minutes. I counted mine as five instead of eight. So I, I, can, I can slow down a little bit. <clears throat> the other one is, is product. Again, you may not have heard of this name. Uh, when preparing for this, this, this presentation, uh, before that, I actually did not know this brand existed. It's called G5. Very, you know, very hot, sexy, and all that stuff. But they're doing simple thing called mobile phones. But guess what? 
Uh, most of us have iPhone. These days, increasingly, uh, uh, Samsung. But G5, a brand, at least for me, I did not hear of, has a global market share of 1.4%. Not high, but for a brand that we, who have heard of G5 here? None of us. Oh, one. Plus me, two. Right? <laughs> because of this presentation. Otherwise, it would be one. Right? A brand that we have never heard of yet has a global market share of mobile phone of 1.4%. How did they do it? They did not come to UK. They did not, they did not go to uh, uh, the US. They went to the emerging markets with special needs. Example in India. Right, uh, from, a, from a size of a population of market is, is right after China. And India, because it's dispersed and uh, uh, you know, power supplies doesn't come uh, readily available. So what do you do? Instead of one battery, you give two. Right. Again, it's not, it's not something out of, it's not something you know, out of, out of uh, another planet, but it's something very effective. Right. In, uh, I was in Dubai a couple of weeks ago. Uh, those of you who, who come from Middle East have been there. One of the recreation activities is, guess what? Go picnic at the, de uh, at the desert, right? So if you've been there, they, they actually have tents uh, at the desert. So they like to play music, but at the desert, you know, we know the wind is strong and all that. So what do you do? The same G5 phone, but it's meant for the Middle East market. They built in with loudspeakers so that you can actually enjoy your music uh, uh, <laughs> at the desert. All right, so again, nothing extraordinary, yet none of us have thought of that before. Very effective in the local marketplace. All right, so with my exact one minute left, uh, so what can you expect? Again, China is not at a stage whereby we need to have another you know, Apple type of company, at least not yet. But because of Chinese being everywhere in the world, the companies are capturing on that trend whereby if I come up with something that, that satisfies my China market, it is very easy for them to actually go global because all of you are everywhere. Thank you very much. <laughs>
come to China, expect what China is, right? So you have a better chance of success. Same thing, when we talk about innovation, if we try to impose what China innovation should be, you, you basically ended up with frustration, you know, with doubts and all that stuff, and you miss the party. The key thing is accept what China innovation is, and can you ride that wave? So right now, I think China will benefit from any any forms of, of innovation, particularly in the process. Okay, right, thank you. We're ready to roll. Uh, okay. Professor? Well, I will speak Chinese. Thank Please put a ear on your phone. <laughs> <laughs> well,我叫朱清石来自深圳所以我首先给大家概括一下二零一二年中国政府投资教育金费是把自己家里头的最好的东西或者是最大的存款最著名的科学家钱学森说的因此这个话吧钱学森的这个话对中国整个教育界主要是有两方面的和学生比如像批判思维的能力中国如果读过上过托儿 
教改的结果就是把应试教育或者知识传承型教育变为这个能力培养型素质教育。中国为什么没有跟跟上这次教改呢？其原因在于吧，中国的教育系统高度行政化了。行政化吧，实际上就是官僚化了。这个行政化是什么意思呢？就是中国的教育系统的各个单位吧，都已经改造为一个个行政系统的下属机构了。行政机构的下属机构最大的特点就是是谁的官大谁说了算，而不是谁掌握真理，谁能够把教育追求卓越，谁说了算。因此吧。教育的最深刻的动力，教育改革最深刻的动力叫做追求卓越，就已经退居第二第二位的地位了。这就是中国的教育吧，为什么一直没有改造好的原因。综上两个原因吧，中国现在正在发生很深刻的教育改革。呃，我想我所代表的学校就是南方科技大学，是其中的例子之一。南方科技大学是深圳市，呃，用全市的力量要建立一所一步到位建成的研究型大学。呃，深圳市的背景就是深圳市在三十年前还是个小渔村，三十年中间吧，发展成了一个大都市。它现在从当初的几万人的人口，发展到现在有一千多万人的人口，它的 GDP 吧，已经是全国名列第四。大城市各个省市中间名列第四。那么深圳最大的遗憾就是，它三十年的发展，经济有大的发展，但是呢，教育和科研没有发展起来。所以吧，深圳市决定倾全市的财力，建一所一流的研究型大学。这所大学呢，就叫做南方科技大学。我呢是三年以前被呃深圳市招聘到深圳。去筹建南方科技大学的，南方科技大学的使命就是两个，第一个就是探索中国教育改革从知识传授型到素质教育型的一条可行的道路；第二个就是在中国的国大背景下，呃，实行去行政化，就是把教育把高校恢复到它的本来面目。用追求卓越来推动学校，而不是用行政命令来推动学校，做这两项实验。那么南方科技大学的呃 ，OK， 南方科技大学的使命就是以上两个。我们经过这三年的努力吧，呃，已经初具规模。呃，按照深圳市给我们的呃这个呃制定的工薪酬标准，从全世界招聘了。一百多位一流的教授，然后呢，我们已经招了两届学生，呃，已经有两百多学生了。学校吧，正在准备招第三届学生。呃，我想这次论坛还有机会，我会比较详细的介绍南方科技大学。南方科技大学吧，不是光是一个学校，是代表着中国教育现在正在的转型。谢谢大家，我就先讲这么多。Um, I don't know about all of you, but I could have uh, I, I could have had every speaker for about three times as long as they had. But anyway, we we we, we are where we are. So if I can ask people to make their questions very very quick and specifically, where are the where are the microphones? We just got one. Can you come down halfway? So are you ready? Uh, if you pick up the first one there, just there. That's it. That lady there. Bring that one down here to this gentleman. Just ask your question quickly, or you lose your chance. 好，呃，朱校长，我想我的问题就是，你作为一个呃中国一个创新型大学的一个领导，您问您在未来会不会有鼓励学生把创新，就是 innovation， 用于到创业，就是说 innovative entrepreneurs entrepreneurship， 鼓励他们去把这种创新精神更多的运用于到应用到社会上来。就是虽然说我知道南昌大学是做研究型大学。但是我想知道您未来有没有这样一种计划，或者说把这种精神变成南昌大的一种 core value 一种价值观？谢谢。好，谢谢谢谢。呃，南方科技大学就是希望鼓培养学生的创新能力，并且鼓励学生吧把创新不仅用到研究上，而且用到这个创业上，这个是没有疑问的，这是我们的目标。谢谢。
Uh, thank you very much. My name is uh, Feng Xue from uh, China Business News. My question is to uh, Mr. Huang. Uh, you mentioned the uh, uh, top executive of Tengxin uh, got uh, more than one million hair pay than the executive from uh, the Bao uh, Steel Group. But the question is, uh, will the progress of Chinese innovative sector can change the Chinese political landscape? Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I guess that uh, we are here. More questions. I guess we are here to talk about the, uh, uh, the impact of innovation on, on China's growth. I would rather feel comfortable to talk about that. I think that innovation is very important for growth. And uh, uh, as China uh, uh, develops further, I think that uh, we definitely will see more innovation in that area. Uh, as uh, you know, uh, innovation further develops, I think that, uh, they, um, I think that it probably will change uh, political dynamics going forward. The rising of middle class and uh, then the discussion through the internet, Weibo, so on so forth. Okay, next one, sir. Uh, first, thank you for Zhu Lao Shi for sharing his understanding of education. My question is very simple. In the current situation of China, there are many children who are not able to get the education of the poor countries, especially in the lower countries, who are not able to get the education of the poor countries. 呃，请问朱老师，您是怎么看待的？而这个又跟刚刚您提到提到的教育的创新性这一个问题，又是怎么去联系，还有怎么去解决这两个问题和平衡两者之间的关系呢？谢谢。对的，对，谢谢。嗯，这这个问题很好。第一，就是中国教育最大的问题是教育公平。教育公平就是缩小城市和农村小孩子们的这个就学机会上的差别。教育公平吧，是超出我们教育改革的问题，这个是国家一个呃国策要做的。现在吧，我觉得今年教育公平已经有一个比较明显的进步，就是高考啊，原来都是按户籍，呃，农农村的务工子女进了城市吧，他还是不能够到当地参加高考，所以异地高考问题吧，现在不管怎么样，已经迈出了第一步了。这是一个，第二个，南方扩大追求的呃教教改啊，我们的招生主要是自主招生考试，自主招生考试着重考的是学生的创新能力，就是批判思维能力、想象力、洞察力、注意力这样的能力。这些能力吧，农村小孩并不吃亏，他们吧，尽管没在没有在城市没有进重点中学，但是他们的这些能力素质还是不差。所以，我们就希望我们的自主招生考试吧，能够向农村、呃非重点的中学学生倾斜。这正是我们要呃努力做的，就是从通过教改的角度去改变这个教育公平的问题。谢谢啊。Thank you. That's the next one there. 呃，你好，我想问问陈先生一个问题，就是首先您刚刚说那个创新的问题，我就想问一下两个问题。第一是，呃，中国有那个之前有过山寨手机。它确实是您说的，用电能力特别强，可以用好好几天。然后 ，speaker 的声音也特别大，然后呃，功能也特别多。但为什么它最后还是没有继续被发展下来，而到现在几乎